In the early morning hours of January 1st, 2010, the vibrant city of Miami was about to witness a chilling start to the new decade. The city, known for its sun-kissed beaches and pulsating nightlife, was about to become the backdrop of a grim and gruesome murder case that would shock the nation. This is the story of Paula Sladowski. Paula Angela Sladowski was born on November 15th of 1983 to Patsy Watkins and Paul Sladowski. She was raised alongside her older siblings, Kelly and Thomas. Paula's father was largely absent from her life, which seems to have had a significant impact on Paula. This would possibly influence some of her later decisions and actions. His absence was also hard on Paula's mother, who was now juggling the responsibility of raising three children alone. Providing for a family as a single mother is not easy, and Patsy faced many challenges along the way. She worked long hours, which led to the children being unsupervised much of the time. Paula's sister was 14 by the time Paula was born, so she took on a significant role in Paula's upbringing. While she certainly did the best she could, there are effects that come from a child raising a child. But things seemed to stabilize for the family when Patsy married a man named Richard Watkins. He stepped in as a father figure, filling this void in Paula's life. Paula grew up in Garden City, Michigan, and from a very young age was a girl with aspirations. She was obsessed with Barbie dolls and often seen emulating the glamorous Barbie lifestyle. This love of Barbie dolls grew with her into adult years, and at the time of her death, she had a massive collection of over 500 Barbie dolls, many of which were unopened. Paula spent her childhood dressing up and experimenting with makeup. Like many young children, her makeup didn't always turn out the best, but that did not faze Paula. She was full of confidence. As she stepped into her teenage years, she began to consider modeling. But Paula was not content with just being a model. She aspired to be a top model or a leading actress. She took great care of her appearance and always ensured she looked her best. Her mom later said that every time Paula left the house, she looked like a movie star. As her mom would watch Paula leave, she'd think to herself, there goes my Marilyn Monroe. However, Paula was much more than just a pretty face. She was witty, intelligent, and above all, compassionate. She excelled academically and worked hard to maintain straight A's. But while she was incredibly smart, she was also very naive. This, along with her empathetic and caring nature, led to her trusting people far too easily. In fact, her brother frequently had to remind her that there's evil in the world and that she needed to be careful. She also had a deep desire to help people, which led her to consider a career in nursing. If that didn't work out, she hoped to open a tanning salon or a dog store called Paula's Puppy Palace. It's clear that Paula had a lot of dreams and ambitions for herself. But during this time, there were some questionable parenting decisions which may have shaped Paula's future. When Paula was just 14, a 29-year-old man named David Coleman began pursuing her. Despite the clear inappropriateness of the situation, Paula's mother allegedly didn't try to put a stop to the relationship. Paula's sister Kelly made several attempts to convince their mother to intervene. When her pleas fell on deaf ears, she herself ended up reporting the relationship to Child Protective Services. David was arrested and was incarcerated for two years. As a result of this, he was added to the sex offender registry. However, by the time David was released, Paula was 16. This is the age of consent in Michigan, and so the pair quickly resumed their relationship. This gives us an important insight into the family dynamic Paula was raised in. After high school, Paula still had dreams of entering the healthcare field, but unfortunately she didn't have the financial means. Paula had high expectations for her life, which didn't include working any low-paying jobs. So she found a different path, becoming an exotic dancer. This combined her passions for both modeling and dancing. While her mother wasn't thrilled about Paula's new profession, Paula was frank about her choice, telling her mother she was making amazing money. She transformed herself physically, bleaching her brown hair blonde and adding extensions. She also bought herself a cherry red Mustang convertible and painted her kitchen pink. She began to look more like a Barbie doll than ever before. Her sister believes that Paula's lack of a father figure in her early years may have influenced her decision to become a dancer. She suggested that Paula may have been seeking the love and attention that she didn't get growing up. Paula's relationship with David deteriorated and eventually they decided to end the relationship. But they did remain friends and occasionally exchanged text messages, which we will touch on later. It was no surprise when Paula ended up pursuing her dream of becoming a successful model. In 2003, Playboy magazine was holding nationwide auditions for new Playmates. Paula had been doing quite a bit of smaller modeling jobs, but nothing this big. She knew this opportunity could potentially launch her into the spotlight, so she decided to audition. Her striking looks and charisma made her a standout, and she was one of 500 who made the first cut. 
She made each subsequent cut until it was narrowed down to 50. Unfortunately, Paula did not make the final cut. However, she was featured in Playboy's 50th anniversary celebration video, which was a huge accomplishment. But along with this success came an introduction to the darker side of life. Paula's career as an exotic dancer introduced her to a lifestyle that was fast-paced and alluring. Parties and alcohol became a staple, and soon cracks began to show. As Paula's partying escalated, her mother and stepfather began to notice a drastic change in her personality when she was under the influence. Paula was also taking prescription diet pills, which can have an unintended side effect of irritability and mood changes, especially when paired with alcohol. Paula would transform into a different person when she drank. Her mother described these episodes as scary, stating that Paula had a tendency to become aggressive and argumentative. She would later say, once Paula started drinking, she would change from Dr. Jekyll to Mr. Hyde. Paula's stepfather also described her as being a mean drunk. Often Paula would wake up in the morning with shakes. When her mother would warn her that she was showing signs of alcoholism, Paula didn't want to hear it. She would get very upset, which led to many arguments. This was a side of Paula that was hidden from the public eye a side that was vastly different from the glamorous model and dancer that people saw on stage. The party lifestyle was slowly taking a toll on Paula, both physically and emotionally, but the worst was yet to come. It was during this tumultuous time that Paula met a man named Kevin Klim. Right off the bat, Paula and Kevin were absolutely crazy about each other, but from the very beginning, their relationship was a roller coaster. When it was good, it was great, but when it was bad, it was awful. Kevin, from the beginning, expressed his discomfort with Paula's profession. This became a constant source of conflict in their relationship. Paula was a woman of ambition and determination. She was saving money for nursing school, and she had no intention of letting anyone get in the way. So she presented Kevin with an ultimatum, accept her lifestyle or leave. Kevin chose to stay. The same year they began dating, Kevin was arrested during a drug bust in Michigan. He was charged with possession of cocaine. With the substantial income Paula was bringing in, the pair eventually decided to move to California. Paula left her dancing career behind and followed her dream of going to nursing school. But for reasons unknown, she didn't complete the program. Speculation suggests she had grown accustomed to the hefty paycheck she had received from dancing. But whatever the reason, Paula returned to the stage. This decision didn't sit well with Kevin, who was facing his own challenges. He had tried to open a mortgage business, but the housing market crashed and his venture collapsed. Both were stuck in a tumultuous cycle with no stability in their relationship, dreams, or life in general. For the next few years, Paula and Kevin would move back and forth between California and Michigan, which only added to the turmoil. Paula's sister didn't know Kevin well, but believed him to be a nice enough guy. From what she saw, he seemed to make Paula happy. And by all accounts, it is true that when they were sober, they couldn't have been happier. However, this happiness was merely a facade, masking a darker reality. Paula's stepfather would later reveal that their relationship was fraught with conflict from the very beginning. Their arguments escalated into physical knockdown fights. These fights were especially bad when the couple was drinking or doing drugs, which was often. Paula's parents pleaded with them to end their relationship, but their pleas fell on deaf ears. Paula and Kevin would say, but we love each other. At one point, Paula had even confided in her mom that Kevin said if she ever left him, he would cut her up in little pieces and they would never find her body. Paula also confided in her ex-boyfriend David through text messages, expressing her fear of Kevin. She would say things like, help me, I'm in trouble, he's trying to kill me. Another time, she texted him saying she was hiding from the beast. At one point, she had even texted him for help after Kevin allegedly locked her in the garage. This was a chilling precursor to the dark turn their story was about to take. However, it's clear that Kevin was not the only one with a temper. In the summer of 2009, Paula was arrested after a heated argument culminated in her breaking a glass bottle over the back of Kevin's head. Paula was charged with assault with a deadly weapon, not a firearm, which is a felony. She was released on a $50,000 bond, though the charge was later dismissed after Kevin declined to press charges. In late 2009, Kevin was arrested for domestic assault and larceny. According to the complaint, Paula claimed that Kevin took money out of her purse. When she confronted him, the couple began to argue and Kevin allegedly slapped her. Paula would later decline to press charges for the larceny, but stated that she wanted to pursue the assault case. In December of 2009, the couple visited Paula's family in Michigan for the holidays. This was just a couple days after Kevin's last arrest. At this point in the story, Paula was 26 and Kevin was 34. 
While in Michigan, the couple attended a Christmas party at Paula's sister's house. During the party, they were happy getting along and showering each other with love. Paula's sister invited Paula and Kevin over for a small New Year's Eve gathering, but they declined the invitation because they had plans to fly to Las Vegas to celebrate the new year. So everything seemed to be going well at that point, but things took a dark turn when the couple arrived back at their hotel later that day. Paula had left the hotel room and when she came back, she found liquor bottles all over the floor and Kevin asleep. She woke Kevin up and confronted him about the mess. Kevin got angry and the couple began arguing. Paula then threatened to have him kicked out. She picked up the phone to call security and Kevin punched her in the face, breaking her nose and fracturing her cheekbone. He would later claim this was an accident. The hotel tried to call them back, but when Paula tried to answer the call, Kevin knocked the phone out of her hand so hard that it ripped the cord out of the wall. Paula was able to get out of the room, but Kevin followed her. The couple was met in the lobby by the police, and Kevin was arrested. Paula was set to testify against Kevin on January 5th, but this did not seem to phase Paula and Kevin, who flew out to Miami just a week later. Originally, they planned to head to Las Vegas, but a change in plans occurred when Paula discovered that Lady Gaga was hosting a concert in Miami. This was described as an event that all the stars and big names were going to be at. As soon as Paula found out about this, she immediately purchased plane tickets, hoping that the couple could get in. You see, the concert was sold out and they did not have tickets. But that was Paula, spontaneous and determined. The couple managed to get tickets from a scalper for a hefty $700 each, and by all accounts, they had a great time at the show. However, a man standing behind them was so put off by Kevin's behavior that he actually recorded them specifically in case he had to show it to police later. This is because Kevin was allegedly being aggressive and obnoxious, pushing people out of the way as they maneuvered through the crowd. The rest of the weekend was filled with partying, as they hopped from one nightclub to another. At one of these stops, they met a bartender who mentioned a popular all-night club. It was called Club Space, and it was described as the hotspot of Miami. As soon as Paula heard this, she had to go. After a romantic dinner on South Beach, Paula bought a neon blue club dress to wear to Club Space later that night. With several hours of drinking already under their belts, the couple returned to La Flora Hotel for a nap. Waking up refreshed, Paula spent an hour perfecting her hair and makeup before the couple headed to Club Space. They arrived at around 5.30 a.m., at which point Paula handed her phone to Kevin. This was because her dress didn't have pockets. The club was everything they had imagined, and Paula was ready to have a good time. However, things quickly spiraled out of control. As soon as they walked in, Paula immediately turned heads. Despite already having consumed a substantial amount of alcohol, men in the club continued to offer her more shots. The evening, which had started on such a high note, was about to take a dangerous turn. According to Kevin, Paula began to draw attention with her provocative dance moves and vivacious personality, much to his dismay. As time went on, the men in the club were becoming increasingly forward, and one man in particular seemed to be crossing the line. Kevin described this particular incident, saying, I turn around for a second and he's on her. He's got his hand around her waist, his crotch right up against her. He's leaning down kissing and she's looking over at me, kind of like laughing and whatever. At this point, they had been at the club for about an hour and a half, and Kevin was feeling frustrated and over the whole thing, so he decided it was time to leave. Paula was having an absolute blast and was fully engrossed in the party atmosphere. She had no desire to leave, which resulted in a heated exchange. Kevin tried to pull her away, but Paula yanked back and pushed him away, stating that she was not leaving. Before Kevin could even react, the couple was surrounded by bouncers who told Kevin that he needed to leave. He handed Paula her credit card upon her request, and then he was escorted out. The surveillance footage then showed Kevin conversing with a bouncer outside. According to Kevin, he was asking the bouncer to inform Paula that he was leaving. The bouncer disappeared inside the club and returned a few minutes later. He then told Kevin that Paula had insisted on staying. This marked the beginning of a series of events that would change the course of their lives forever. The timestamp on the surveillance footage shows Kevin leaving the club at 7.17 a.m. At that point, Kevin wasn't sure what to do, so he figured he'd head back to the hotel and sleep it off. He then took a taxi back to the hotel, which was later confirmed by police. His decision has since sparked a wave of criticism. Many have pointed out his negligence leaving Paula vulnerable in a potentially dangerous situation. To add fuel to the fire, Kevin still had Paula's phone with him, leaving her without a means of communication. While Paula was an adult and responsible for her own decisions, many argue that there exists a moral responsibility. This decision, though made in a moment of anger and frustration, would come back to haunt him as the events of that fateful morning unfolded. 
Less than five minutes later, the clock on the surveillance footage struck 7.21 a.m. Paula was then also escorted out of the club. This was due to the club's policy of removing both parties after a fight. What Paula and Kevin didn't know was that they just missed each other by mere seconds. The footage is hard to see, but it showed the head of security following Paula as she walked to the exit. By the door, there is what appears to be more bouncers. The head of security then followed Paula out of the building. As soon as they turned the corner and exited the frame, two other bouncers quickly followed behind them. The footage captured the last known images of Paula alive. A few hours later, Kevin woke up alone in their hotel room. His throbbing headache was a painful reminder of the previous night's events. He was surprised to find that Paula hadn't made it back to their hotel room. However, he wasn't immediately alarmed. This wasn't the first time Paula had stayed out after a fight, and she always found her way back. Paula was a tough girl from Detroit, so he figured she could handle Miami. Little did he know, this time was different. As the morning sun climbed higher, Kevin's concern for Paula began to grow. His groggy, hungover state began to fade, and he slowly became more alert. At around 11.30 a.m., the silence of the hotel room was disrupted by an unexpected call from the hotel front desk. The staff inquired if the couple was planning on extending their stay. This was because Paula and Kevin had missed their checkout time. Kevin began to gather himself and headed downstairs to speak with the hotel manager. He appeared very distraught as he told her he didn't know where his girlfriend was. The manager tried to calm him down and suggested he try to get Paula's picture out to the public. And with that, Kevin was on his way. He first headed to the Miami Police Department. However, he was met with an unexpected hurdle. They informed him that he would need to go to the North Miami Police Department, since that is where Paula had actually gone missing. When Kevin arrived at the North Miami Police Department, he was met with another unexpected hurdle. They suggested he should wait to file the report until Paula had been missing for at least 24 hours. At this point, Kevin realized he wasn't going to get much help. Frustrated but determined, Kevin began his own frantic search for Paula. He called hospitals and jails, but unfortunately, none of them had a record of Paula. He visited a few businesses around town, showing them pictures of Paula on his phone. He even returned to club space, hoping to find some trace of her. Unfortunately, by that time, the club had closed, and no one around seemed to recognize her picture. He even offered money to a few homeless people in the area, hoping for some information. It was then that he was directed to a nearby gas station. This gas station had security cameras that could have captured Paula. Kevin then took a taxi to the gas station and showed Paula's picture to the cashier, who unfortunately did not recognize her. This interaction was captured on surveillance footage. Kevin's efforts were met with disappointment at every turn. Paula seemed to have vanished into thin air. Kevin then took the taxi back to the hotel, where he began looking up local private investigators. He found one that he thought would be a good match and called him. This PI would later note that Kevin sounded genuinely panicked and upset. Kevin explained the circumstances and how he was told to wait 24 hours before reporting Paula missing. The PI then assured Kevin that he had some connections and requested they meet at the police station. With the private investigator's help, Kevin was finally able to get a missing persons report filed. The PI then urged Kevin to return to the hotel and wait, while he headed over to club space hoping to find something that would lead them to Paula. And with that, the search for Paula Sladowski had officially begun a search that would soon unravel a horrifying truth. As the private investigator delved deeper into the investigation, he spoke with several employees at the club. Some of the employees did in fact remember Paula. He also spoke with the head of security at the club, who explained that according to the club's policy, all parties involved in an altercation were removed. He explained that Paula had been escorted out shortly after Kevin. This was the first time they learned that Paula had also been kicked out. The man claimed that after leading Paula to the door, he watched her walk down the stairs and turn right, heading to the east. Here's where things took a turn. He claimed that he then witnessed Paula engaging in conversation with an unknown man. The man was described as a six-foot-tall, heavy-set, light-skinned African-American or Hispanic man. He was sporting a goatee and casually dressed in a t-shirt and shorts. The pair were observed walking off holding hands as if they were a couple. Kevin was obviously shocked to hear this. They didn't know anyone in Miami, so this wasn't just a case of Paula running into an old friend. Kevin also didn't believe that Paula would just go off with a stranger she had met in that moment, especially not holding hands. This led Kevin to believe that this must have been someone she met in the club. He believed they would have hung out and talked for a while in order for Paula to feel that comfortable. But even more damning, Kevin remembered seeing an employee fitting the man's description. 
The club management was quick to deny that the man was an employee or even a patron, citing that his attire would have violated their dress code. Because of this, he would not have been permitted to enter the club. This new lead added another layer of complexity to Paula's disappearance, leaving more questions than answers. As the investigation continued, another witness came forward. A local man had been out walking his dog the morning of Paula's disappearance. According to him, he saw a truck driving the wrong way down a one-way street just a block from club space. The driver was a white man in his 50s. The witness was able to recall this because the man's odd driving had caught his attention. The truck was heading towards a blonde woman, whom the witness identified as Paula. The truck pulled up next to her and she climbed into the truck before the pair then drove off. The witness claimed that he had reported this sighting to the authorities, but they never followed up. Those who knew Paula insisted that she was street smart and would never get into a stranger's vehicle. On the other hand, Paula was intoxicated and low on options. At this point, three days had passed and Kevin was unable to sit idly by at the hotel. On a whim, he decided to call the medical examiner's office. He explained what happened and provided a detailed description of Paula. After a nerve-wracking wait, the examiner returned to the line informing Kevin that a detective would need to speak with him. Kevin was immediately overcome with a sense of dread. Shortly after, a detective arrived and Kevin again explained the circumstances of Paula's disappearance. The detective asked if Paula had any piercings and Kevin confirmed that she did. The detective presented a Ziploc baggie with two charred, barely recognizable pieces of metal. He asked Kevin if these belonged to Paula. Kevin looked closely and relief washed over him for a second. They weren't Paula's, or so he thought. But upon comparing them to a photo of Paula's earrings, the horrifying truth began to set in. The burnt jewelry was indeed Paula's. It was then that the detective informed Kevin that he believed they had Paula's body at the medical examiner's office but they would need dental records to positively identify her. What Kevin didn't know was that while he was desperately searching for Paula, something truly evil was happening just across town. At around 9 p.m. that evening, the fire department had responded to a burning dumpster in an industrial area near Biscayne Park, approximately 12 miles north of the club. The flames were several feet high, making it hard to see anything. But once they got the flames under control, an absolutely horrific scene awaited them. Inside the dumpster was a badly charred body, unrecognizable as male or female. The lead detective described it as the most disturbing crime scene he had ever witnessed. The body was so burned that he would later say, we had nothing else to go by other than it was a human being. The only other thing they had were two small pieces of charred metal, which would later be identified as Paula's jewelry. The responders immediately contacted police who quickly arrived on scene. When the detective couldn't find any missing persons matching the description, the body was listed as a Jane Doe. The reality was beginning to sink in. The whole time Kevin was desperately searching for Paula, her body lay unidentified at the medical examiner's office. They now knew that this body was likely Paula, but her body was so badly burned there was no way to confirm that without her dental records. Kevin was able to get them in contact with Paula's family to obtain her dental records, Tragically, it was confirmed that these were the remains of Paula Angela Sladowski. They received this devastating news on her mother's birthday. The gruesome state of the body left the medical examiner with little to speculate about the cause of death. She didn't appear to have been shot or stabbed, which led to the conclusion that she was possibly suffocated or strangled. They also weren't able to determine if she had been sexually assaulted. Thankfully, it did not appear that Paula was still alive when she was set on fire. Investigators believe that the fire was either set out of hate and anger or as a way to destroy any forensic evidence. And if that was the motivation behind the fire, it worked. This fire had destroyed any potential forensic evidence, leaving a cold trail for the investigators. Upon hearing the news of her sister's death, Kelly immediately made arrangements to fly out to Miami. She was desperate for answers and was willing to do anything to find out what had happened to her sister. Meanwhile, the police had begun to set their sights on Kevin, they didn't necessarily view him as a suspect, rather a key witness. After all, there was initially nothing suspicious about Kevin. He appeared genuinely concerned and distraught, plastering posters of the missing Paula around town and talking to anyone who might have seen her. He also didn't have any scratches or bruises on him, which you would generally expect to see. Not to mention, according to Paula's sister, the person who did this would have been absolutely covered in scratches, because Paula was a fighter. Authorities also believed that the suspect was familiar with the dumping area. This was because the location of the dumpster wasn't somewhere a tourist would just stumble upon. It was on an out-of-the-way dead-end street. The investigators simply hoped that Kevin would be able to give them some insight. 
But the investigators' focus shifted when they learned that Kevin had a history of assaulting Paula, a fact that would quickly turn him from a key witness into a person of interest. The following day, the police picked Kevin up and took him to the station for questioning. He was questioned for over 12 hours and not released until after midnight. Their approach was a psychological game of cat and mouse. They oscillated between accusing him outright and assuring him they knew he was innocent. This roller coaster of emotions was designed to break his composure. They hoped that he would slip, but Kevin remained steadfast. He waived his right to an attorney and willingly offered his fingerprints, DNA samples, and even volunteered to take a polygraph test. While Kevin fully cooperated with the investigation, the media frenzy that followed painted a different picture. They focused on his previous assault charges, ignoring Paula's. While it may be an uncomfortable truth, it's a part of the whole story. The headlines were filled with sensationalized versions of the story. Despite not actually being a playmate, Paula was dubbed the slain playboy playmate. A narrative was spun that painted Kevin as the villain, and the public was quick to jump on the bandwagon. The reactions from Paula's family and friends were varied, with some believing in Kevin's innocence, while others were convinced of his guilt. Following the media's damning verdict of Kevin, Paula's sister arrived in Florida. She was burdened with the devastating responsibility of making arrangements for Paula's remains to be sent back home. Determined to find justice for Paula, she created flyers and attached them to buildings, poles, and even the dumpster where Paula was found. In an effort to generate information, she offered a reward of $15,000 of her own money. The club owner generously offered to match this, bringing the total reward to a staggering $30,000. Despite Kelly's tireless efforts, the case quickly fell silent. But then two weeks later, a glimmer of hope emerged. An employee at the club reported that the man Paula was last seen with had returned to the club. Authorities immediately arrived at the club and questioned the man, but they were met with a devastating blow. The man was able to provide information that cleared him of any suspicion. It's not specifically stated, but it appears that this was not the same man. The case went quiet again, but two weeks later there was another break. A tipster came forward with a more thorough description of the man Paula was seen leaving with. The tipster met with a sketch artist who was able to come up with a pretty good sketch of the man. The picture was released to the public and again the media went wild, this time directing their suspicions towards this mysterious man. This new wave of media coverage generated a flurry of tips, but unfortunately none led anywhere. The case again went quiet, which is how it remains to this day. When we look at Paula's case, the most obvious suspect is of course Kevin. But while he may have had the means and the motive, the question is did he have the opportunity? Paula's body was found 12 miles away and Kevin didn't have a car. Not to mention, he most likely wouldn't have known about that area. Kevin himself believes that one or more of the club's bouncers was involved. He suspects that everything that had unfolded was a calculated move to isolate Paula. However, the club management vehemently denies this claim, asserting that all their employees were accounted for that night. The employees were required to clock in and out using their hand, so this wasn't something that could just be faked. But is it possible that one of the employees snuck out and returned without anyone noticing? Paula's family has spoken out over the years about their frustration with the investigation. Paula's mother and sister, Patsy Watkins and Kelly Ferris, are with us along with their attorney, Rob Boyers, and Paula's boyfriend, Kevin Klim, and his attorney, Chris Kokonakis. Good morning to all of you. Good morning. Good morning. You, Kelly, you've been through so much, your family, so much pain, first losing your sister, Paula, in that awful way, and then not knowing who did this. Back in February, police did release this sketch of a possible suspect. What's happened with the investigation since then? Uh, Meredith, that has been very frustrating because there's no new information. I know nothing more than I did back then. Um, we haven't, the police just tell us they're still following leads and that that's as far, that's as much information as they give us. So you ask for information, basically they say there's nothing to impart here. Yeah, they, they say that they're still following leads. That's, that's the stock answer that we get. Why do you think the police have been unable to get any break? in this case and all this time? I'm not really sure. I mean, I, I, I'm sure that they want to find who did this and they want to solve this case. Um, you know, there could, be, there could be information out there that they didn't obtain. It's, it's really hard to say without them giving us any, any information. information. Rob, you yeah. were hired by the family, obviously, to help uh, look into this. What did you learn about the status of the investigation into Paula's death? <clears throat> well, unfortunately, we have uh, emailed and, and called uh, the detective that's in charge of the investigation. 
uh, and he has not uh, thus far spoken with us. But what would be the rationale for him not speaking to you? Well, as a former prosecutor from New York, um, there, there can be reasons mm -hmm. uh, not to disclose certain sources or to jeopardize certain witnesses. But by the same token, it would be nice to have a little bit more of a response just in terms of generally speaking what they're following up on. We actually have an investigator who has turned over witnesses to the police uh, who believe that they saw Paula leave the, the club space that night and we don't know whether those witnesses have been investigated or, or spoken to. We also don't know whether a rape kit was done, which would be very important uh, information to have. We also don't know whether videos from outside club space and from the surrounding buildings have been obtained. If you take a look at the Uren uh, Vandersloot case, of course, that can bring an investigation to a very swift conclusion. We don't know what's going on. But if going there were videos that. taken, would that tape even be available at this point? Is it is it played, you know, recorded over? Do you know anything about things like that? How long is it sustainable? If they well, were uh, different uh, commercial establishments have different policies with regard to how long they retain these things. Some 30 days, some 90 days, some longer. Uh, and we've sent some letters out asking for this evidence to be preserved. Uh, we've come on the case relatively recently. We hope that it's still available. And Kevin, you must have been playing this over and over in your mind, probably on a daily basis, wondering what happened. It's a nightmare. I just, it just doesn't end. You know, I mean, I want answers. I want to know what happened to her that night. I want to know why this happened. And just, there's nothing. Patsy, you lost your daughter in January. We've talked so much about her death. Tell us about her. She was my baby. She was a beautiful, beautiful woman. She, she just loved living. She loved traveling. She loved modeling. She loved life. And now she's gone. Well, we're hoping that by you all joining us this morning that somebody out there knows something and will come forward. We appreciate you all being here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Again, Thank you. I'm so sorry for your loss. Paula's ex also gave an interview. Can't believe it's real. Dave Coleman's emotions are raw. His heart broken after learning his former girlfriend, the woman he still hoped one day would be his wife, was murdered. I was praying to God don't let this be. I said, I'll pull her out of there and marry her right now. Hey, go my girls. Paula, who once posed for Playboy, had moved to California from Michigan to pursue her modeling career, but also dreamt of owning her own business. Paula's Puppy Palace. She's going to get a little puppy store. Sorry. Coleman now spends his days looking at the thousands of pictures and videos he took of Paula during the decade they dated. It is, he says, all he has left. Look how happy. She's so happy. Big smiles. You know, especially puppies all around. Oh, little Bella, tears, you know. And that's the way to remember her. The former lead detective for Paula's case has also spoken out about his frustration in not being able to solve Paula's case. It's frustrating. I mean, you know, it's, it's the one case that kind of stands out in, in my career. The death of 26-year-old Paula Sladuski still haunts North Miami Police Commander Michael Gaudio after 13 years as a detective. It's the one that I didn't solve when I was in the detective bureau. It's the one that I, I didn't have be able to give the family a type of closure, you know. Uh, so it, it doesn't bother me. I still think about it still to this day. The murder devastated Sladuski's sister. My sister was 26 years old. She was full of life. She was beautiful. She cared about everybody. The body of Sladuski, a model, was found burning in this North Miami dumpster. It was just surreal. I couldn't, I couldn't imagine anything like this happening. Well, the theory is that I mean, she was killed someplace else and, and brought there. Someone had to know where that dumpster was. That's not something that's common knowledge. Gaudio believes the suspect knew the area and may have lived there. I just plead with anybody out there that has any information to please come forward and hope she did not deserve to die in this way. And I would ask them, you know, you know, look at themselves. If, if they had a family member uh, who was taken from them in, in a very horrendous way, you know, they want other people to help out so they can have some type of closure. And now's the time to come forward. As of today, Paula's murder remains an unsolved mystery, a chilling reminder of the darkness that can lurk beneath the surface of a city known for its sunshine and glamour.